Tonight we have the opportunity to introduce you to two exceptional women. I get to introduce you to one of them, and Margaret will introduce you to the other. The Weider Annual Faculty Award Lecture was established in 1975 to honor Dr. Winifred E. Weider in the year of her retirement after 40 years as an SPU professor. And the endowment to support this scholarship was given by another SPU Emeritus Professor, Ross Shaw, whose legacy we remember just last fall, and it's still funded in part by uh, Shaw's Memorial Fund. The Weider Lecture, quote, provides a public platform from which the claims of the liberal arts in the Christian university are espoused, end quote. For each year, a faculty member is chosen by the Faculty Affairs Committee to receive this honor and to present, quote, scholarship informed by a Christian worldview, end quote. I myself never had the chance to meet Winifred Weider, although I know many of you in this room did have that privilege. Uh, she earned her doctorate in 1933 from the University of Chicago. And when she joined uh, SPU, she was one of the few SPU faculty at the time with a doctorate. And she later admitted a young lady with a brand new, unused PhD was pretty special. So special that with her PhD in classical literature, SPU hired her to teach a PE class. <laughs> but she quickly set out to work creating a new class and eventually a whole new department for classical languages. And over the next 40 years, her passion for Greek and Latin would inspire thousands of students, and her devotion to teaching would uh, inspire thousands, or not thousands, but dozens of young faculty members. She was also SPU's first uh, female coach uh, and led athletic programs here for over a decade. In her role as a faculty member, she modeled many wonderful behaviors. Some of them caught on, others unfortunately did not. I did read that one of her finest qualities was that given her father's prominent position with a leading law firm, she was regularly in the habit of returning her paycheck to the university. But one can only hope. <laughs> this lecture is a wonderful tribute to Dr. Weider's 40 years of service, and I'm sure she was here tonight, as she was really uh, from her retirement all the way through 1975 through 2001. Uh, I'm sure she would have been thrilled to do tonight's presentation. And so with that, I will turn it over to Margaret to introduce to our second section of the interview. On behalf of the Center for Scholarship and Faculty Development, it is a delight to sponsor uh, the 40th year of the Leader Lecture. And my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer. Dr. McKinney is in her 14th year at SPU as Professor of Sociology and Director of the Women's Study Program. Prior to her arrival in 2001, her early career highlights include working at the Association for Religion Data Archives at Purdue, which was then known as the American Religion Data Archive, and then moving with the archives to Pennsylvania State University. She earned her MA and PhD in Sociology at Purdue University, working with the esteemed sociologist and religious studies professor, Dr. Rodney Feeney. Her research interests include gender, religion, and their intersection. She's a rigorous quantitative researcher, having just co-published the textbook, Understanding and Applying Research Design, with our colleague, Martin Abbott. She is also a prolific scholar, with her more recent work focused on gender and the evangelical church. She is a regular reviewer for multiple journals in her guild, including the American Journal of Sociology, Oxford University Press, Journal for the Scientific Study of Religion, and Christian's Scholar Review. The understanding of spiritual formation of Western Christianity often rests on the ascent and deeper understanding of Orthodox beliefs such as those found in the Nicene and Apostle Creeds. To further support and explicate those beliefs, different flavors of American Protestant Christianity have developed or evolved their own types of secondary beliefs to further shed light on scripture and the meaning of Christian faith. Some of these secondary beliefs are hundreds of years old, while others have changed in the past decades. Examples would include the authorship of scripture and its appropriate translation the work of the Holy Spirit, multiple millennial understandings of the return of Christ, the interpretation of Genesis 1 and 2, and for our purposes tonight, legitimate roles for women in the church. 
Drawing from scholarship on sect church process, Professor McKinney will illustrate in her lecture, Sex and Gender, S-E-C-T-S, <laughs> Resistance and Reaction to Cultural Change, how historical iterations of gender ideology within the Christian church have often taken their cues not just from our holy text and church tradition, but from their interactions with the zeitgeist of the surrounding culture. Before we get started tonight, I did want to say a couple of thank yous. Um, most of the work that we do as academicians is fairly solitary, uh, but you really can't do this type of work completely alone. So I would like to thank Karen Snanker. Sarah Koenig, Kevin Newhauser, David Dikema, Michael Hamilton, and Steve Lehman for helping me in this process. I would also like to give a shout out. There are three people who are choosing to spend their birthday evening here this evening. <laughs> so I want to say happy birthday to Deborah Sequera, Brent Brendan, and Robbie Riggle. <laughs> Environment from complete rejection to complete acceptance. 
Sects like religious organizations reject the social environment in which they exist, placing them in higher tension with the environment. And church-like religious organizations accept the social environment in which they exist, placing them in low tension with their environment. In rejecting cultural gender norms, sect-like religious bodies often maintain, maintain higher tension to the society by adopting strict gender beliefs and practices. So the following lecture will receive, proceed in four parts. Part one clarifies the two general narratives of American Protestant gender theologies and sect church theory. Part two describes historic shifts in gender theologies as a response to cultural change, explaining how Christian groups increase or decrease their level of tension with the larger culture. Part three reviews a contemporary example of a sect-like congregation, showing what happens when a strict gender theology does not shift in the midst of significant social change. And then I will conclude with some thoughts on sociology and faith. But before I review the historical shifts in American Christianity, <coughs> it's important for me to delineate the differences between sex, S-E-X, and gender. Sex refers to the biological characteristics that distinguish females and males, emphasizing anatomy, physiology, hormones, and reproductive systems. Sex differences, because they are rooted in biology, are universal across time and space. Gender refers to the social, cultural, and psychological traits linked to females and males. Gender differences vary across time and space because they are socially constructed. Distinguishing these concepts allows us to measure the differences between biological characteristics of females and males and the cultural characteristics of women and men. Part one, gender theologies. Throughout Christian history, Two narratives have been articulated regarding gender. The most well-documented and perhaps criticized is the tradition in which gender relations are organized by the principles of hierarchy and subordination. Sociologist Sally Gallagher illustrates this strain of belief, citing early church fathers who mirrored their own Greco-Roman culture, which was predisposed to misogyny. Some of these teachings included, women do not bear the full image of God, women are the means through which Adam was deceived, women are the devil's gateway, or women are misbegotten. <laughs> this narrative is the root from which today's conservative Christians adopt gender essentialism, or the idea that women and men were created differently in essence, and also hierarchy, men are the head and women are subordinate. Today, this narrative relies on the Apostle Paul's teachings, stating that women should keep silent in the churches, that the man is the head of the woman, and women should not usurp authority over a man. A second narrative, maybe less well known, but also enjoys a long history. This narrative emphasizes partnership and mutuality between women and men, and relies on the Apostle Paul's teaching that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. Proponents of this narrative cite heroines who spread the good news of Christ, like Mary Magdalene, Philip's four daughters, Priscilla, and Phoebe. They also point out Paul's inconsistencies, arguing that if women were forbidden from preaching, Paul would not have instructed them to cover their heads when praying or prophesying in public, nor would he have given spiritual authority to Priscilla in the teaching of Apollos. Proponents also cite church fathers like Tertullian, the same who taught woman is the devil's gateway, for challenging authoritarian models of marriage by urging mutuality between husbands and wives. The question then that is most often asked is which narrative is correct? That's a theological and hermeneutical question. <laughs> Thank goodness I'm not a theologian. <laughs> As a sociologist, I ask a different question. Why do Christian groups change their gender theologies? This question is critical because the fact that Christians do change their gender interpretations over time strongly suggests that they are responding to changes outside of the scriptures. Underneath these narratives lies an often overlooked element of the social nature of religion, how religious groups function in regard to the larger culture. At any given moment in time, religious groups are negotiating their beliefs and actions as a reaction against or an accommodation to the secular culture. Today we see the same phenomenon in American Christianity, where mainline and liberal churches adopt increasingly egalitarian gender ideals, 
and fundamentalists in the evangelical Christian groups adopt increasingly hierarchical gender ideals. The aim of sociology is to see social patterns at work in order to critique them. Why do they, why do the patterns look this way? How are they created? How are they sustained? How might they change? To answer these questions, I turn to an explanation of sect, church, theory. Few concepts in the sociology of religion have engendered as much fascination and frustration as those of church and sect. As concepts that underpin the classification of religious bodies, sect and church, and how they are defined, applied, and interpreted, have generated significant controversy. By the end of the 20th century, researchers clarified sect church theory by using the concepts of tension and strictness. Stark and Finke proposed that sect church theory could be characterized by the amount of tension between religious bodies and the larger culture. Tension is the degree of distinctiveness, separation, and antagonism between a religious group and the outside world. Thus, sect-like bodies exist in higher tension with the surrounding culture, and church-like bodies exist in lower tension with the surrounding culture. While the concept of tension gives a clear explication of how sect-like and church-like bodies are arrayed in regard to the larger culture, the pluralistic religious marketplace that is the United States requires more definition. At some point, competing religious organizations have to differentiate themselves not only from the larger culture, but from other religious organizations offering similar goods. To account for the success of sectarian movements, Larry Iannacone refined sect church theory using an additional characteristic, strictness. <coughs> For sectarian groups, tension creates strong in-group boundaries because the group sustains norms and values that are significantly different from those of the surrounding culture. These distinctive group norms create strict groups. Strict groups are unique in that they have extensive commitment, exclusive beliefs, and expensive behaviors. Extensive commitment allows group doctrine to impinge on everything from defining who members associate with to how they spend their leisure time. Exclusive beliefs permit groups to recognize only one road to salvation and require a life-changing conversion experience for membership. Expensive behaviors impose non-negotiable demands <coughs> on members' behavior. Members pay a high social cost to belong to strict religious groups. Why would anyone join a strict religious group? Well, extensive, exclusive, and expensive groups generate higher levels of commitment solidifying the truth of the group's doctrines, practices, and promises. Strict groups' higher personal costs are balanced by the higher personal satisfaction of belonging to a strong religious body. Higher costs bring out people whose participation would otherwise be low, while simultaneously increasing the participation among those who join. Strictness does more to explain individual rates of religious participation than any other individual level characteristic, including age, sex, race, region, income, education, marital status, and even personal religious beliefs. The strict churches are strong argument has proven to be a powerful predictor of congregational growth, as well as a powerful predictor of the role of gender within a religious group. Religious organizations do not always benefit from increased strictness, however. Increased strictness does add to the attractiveness of a group, but only because its benefits outweigh its costs. Benefits can take the form of greater group participation, commitment, or solidarity. While the benefits of a strict group can be significant, they are not infinite. The benefits of strict groups must be set against their cost, which can include stigma, self-sacrifice, or social isolation. Groups can eventually reach a point beyond which the benefits of increased strictness are outweighed by the cost, driving away virtually all current <coughs> and potential members. To remain strong, sect-like groups must maintain a certain tension with society, adjusting to social change so as not to become too deviant, but not embracing social change so fully as to lose all distinctiveness. Here's where gender plays a critical role. For those of you keeping score at home, this is part two. <laughs> gender and social structure. One of the most powerful mechanisms 
through which sect-like groups maintain tension to the larger culture is by adhering to a gender theology that stands in higher tension with the prevailing cultural idea. Gender has long been a dividing line between sect-like and church-like groups, functioning as a central, salient, effective element of boundary work. For sect-like groups, higher tension is explained as an extension of the Apostle Paul's teaching to be in, but not of, the world. Rather than being static, gender ideals within a given culture are fluid, because culture is fluid. As economic, political, or social structures change, gender ideals change, with religious groups rejecting or accepting new ideas. <coughs> Therefore, it is important to understand the tension between religious organizations and culture to see how gender is harnessed as an important boundary marker. A review of American Christian history shows how gender gets constructed by social forces leading to a Christian group's, Christian group's rejection or acceptance of the culture's gender ideas. So now we'll turn to five historical periods that highlight religious change to see how a religious groups sect-like or church-like response to the culture shift the, shifts their gender ideologies. These cultural historical periods include the revolutionary era, industrialization, the progressive era, the depression and the long decade, and the late 20th century. Throughout American religious history, understandings and practices of gender theologies have shifted as changes have occurred in the culture. The largest, most influential denominations of the early 19th century, the Episcopal, Congregationalist, and Presbyterian denominations, restricted women's religious speech and forbade them to preach. In fact, in 1832, the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church declared that to teach and exhort or to lead in prayer in public is clearly forbidden to women in the holy oracles. Inspired by popular rhetoric of the American Revolution, the upstart religious groups rejected the established religious denominations restrictions on women. Increasing their attention to the larger religious culture and secular culture, the upstart Methodists and Baptists supported women in leadership and preaching. The upstart sects, and that's what we call them, believed that religious authority came from heartfelt experience. Since God communicated directly to believers, it was just as likely that God could inspire women, as well as men, to proclaim the gospel. Nothing symbolized the upstart sex countercultural identity more than their willingness to allow large numbers of women in the pulpit. The widening of women's authority drew vehement criticism from Episcopal, Congregational, and Presbyterian ministers, many of whom argued for the continued silence of women at religious gatherings. Maintaining strict standards of behavior, behavior, for example, no drinking, no gambling, no swearing, and emphasizing the natural equality of all believers, the Methodists and Baptists created high attention to the established religious and secular cultures by being less restrictive on women. Some may equate strictness with restriction. However, strictness does not necessarily mean greater restrictions on women. Strictness is about beliefs and practices that create a higher level of tension to the surrounding culture. The established denominations in the revolutionary era were very restrictive for women, meaning that in order to <coughs> increase tension with the culture, the upstart sex adopted more egalitarian ideals, but still had significantly strict beliefs and practices apart from gender. Thus, they were groups in higher tension with the patriarchal culture. The upstart sex egalitarian bent and focus on persuasion rather than coercion <coughs> or conversion, resulted in the groups becoming larger and more powerful. By the 1830s and 40s, these flourishing groups had become established denominations. During this shift from sect life to church life, the denominations purposely turned away from their more radical roots, decreasing tension with the culture to blend in with the established denominations. The Methodists, who had once been open to women in leadership, were now restricting women going so far as to excommunicate one preacher when she refused to stop holding meetings. The decreasing tension of the upstart sex coincided with a significant economic shift to industrial capitalism. This economic shift would prescribe denominational gender roles for decades to come. Oops. In the mid-19th century, 
century, America's agrarian economy gave way to the wage-based industrial economy, where not only did the nature of work change, gender ideas changed as well. Industrialization created a separate spheres, gender ideology. As men moved away from the family farm and home production into wage-based urban factory work, women carried on with the traditional home production of the rural economy. The separation of families created a gender ideology that constituted women and men as opposites. This ideal awarded some human traits to women and others to men, creating what we now call the cult of true womanhood and the cult of the self-made man. True women were expected to be pious, sexually pure, submissive, and domestic. Self-made men were supposed to be economically successful, independent, self-controlled, and responsible. This gender dichotomy shifted the institution of religion into the female sphere, defining women as the naturally religious sex. Defining them as the naturally productive sex shifted paid labor into the male sphere. American Christian denominations quickly adapted to these, to these gender ideals legitimating them through scripture, and stipulating that women and men were created by God to hold these particular traits and roles, even though praxis and history illustrated otherwise. The white middle class denominations that accepted the gender theology of true women and self-made men were some of the same denominations that had previously existed in higher tension with the culture. The old upstart sex were now church-like and their acceptance of cultural gender ideas. At the same moment that most white denominations were adapted to the cult of true womanhood and the cult of the self-made man, a different and alternative gender theology was created by black Christians. Traditionally designated as laborers, a category that casts them as less than fully human, black women and men were excluded by the dominant gender theology. Developing an alternative theology, black families rejected separate spheres defining women like men by their resourcefulness, independence, and intelligence. It was not acceptable for white women to openly display their intelligence. For black women, not using their God-given intelligence was to dishonor God and their families. Feminist Maggie Walker declared in a 1912 speech to the Federation of Colored Women's Clubs that every woman was by divine providence created not for some man to marry, take home, and support, but for the purpose of using her powers, ability, health, and strength to forward the financial success of the partnership into which she may go, if she will. Therefore, white Protestant denominations decreased their tension with the culture, adopting the cults of true womanhood and self-made man, while black Protestant denominations increased their tension to the culture, rejecting the cults of true womanhood and self-made man. The separate spheres of industrialization created a moral capitalistic order by marrying, literally, pious women to productive men, alleviating the fears of unrestrained capitalism. By the end of the 19th century, the changing relationship between business and religion called for a new gender theology, muscular Christianity. Noting that in one of their slogans, the women have had charge of the church work long enough, Protestant men began to see religion as effeminate, and moved to recodify it as masculine. In the words of muscular Christianity star Billy Sunday, <laughs> the Lord save us from off-handed, blood cheek, rib bone, weak knee, thin skin, high of plastic, spineless, effeminate, ossified, three care Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> and that's pretty much how I said it. <laughs> muscular Christians successfully realigned the relation between religion and commerce by reshaping constructions of gender reducing tension between the established Protestant denominations and the economic culture. Women who had been considered the purveyors of religious faith for home, church, and society during industrialization lost their influence in Protestant denominational life. In fact, by the end of the 1920s, the vibrant women's missionary associations, which had been founded, organized, and run entirely by women, had all been taken over by male denominational leaders. By decreasing tension with the larger culture, the established Protestant denominations significantly restricted religious women. Muscular Christianity peaked in the 1920s, precisely the time that American Protestantism fractured. Fundamentalist Protestantism was born in an era of anxiety over gender roles. The Great Depression made, the, made women's economic contributions to the family crucial for all but the very wealthy. As women moved more and more into paid labor, 
mainline denominations decreased their tension with society. These denominations relaxed their restrictions on women and gradually gave them a larger role within their congregations. Fundamentalists increased tension with society in a decisive reaction against the conventional Victorian piety that had elevated women as keepers of morality. Reversing the Victorian ideals, fundamentalists now asserted that men had a natural aptitude for religion and were divinely equipped to defend Christian orthodoxy. Women, on the other hand, were defined not only as having no moral or natural aptitude for religion, they were also classified as the psychologically vulnerable sex. Because fundamentalism claimed a monopoly on Protestant orthodoxy by adhering to five fundamental doctrines, their emerging tradition conflated gender theology with orthodoxy. In the wake of fundamentalism's success, increasing their tension with society, church-like religious bodies decreased their tension by adopting increasingly egalitarian theologies. And they did this not only to blend in with the culture, but also to make sure they separated themselves from the fundamentalists. Church-like denominations defended gender equality and inclusion primarily through a Wesleyan perfectionist doctrine that required a non-literal thematic reading of the Pauline prescriptions used to silence women. This egalitarian argument relied on the idea that biblical restrictions on women's leadership in the church had been swept away by the atoning death and resurrection of Christ. Fundamentalists rejected cultural and historical readings of the New Testament, especially as regarded women and women's roles. The founding of fundamentalism within American Protestantism has had profound effects on the current understandings of gender that we have. In the 1930s and 40s, men within fundamentalism sought to bridge the chasm between fundamentalist and modernist Protestantism with neo-evangelicalism, what we refer to today as simply evangelicalism. The evangelical movement was an attempt to bring fundamentalism out of its intellectual isolation in order to broaden its appeal. Evangelicalism combined the scriptural orthodoxy of fundamentalism with the social engagement of liberalism, creating a Protestant movement of engaged orthodoxy. Does that sound familiar to some of you? <laughs> Changing the company. <laughs> Evangelicals like fundamentalists conflated gender theology with orthodoxy, which meant that evangelicals adopted gender hierarchy as the naturally ordered creation of masculine authority and feminine weakness. As America came out of World War II, fundamentalist and evangelical Christian theologies perfectly suited the post-war family life of the breadwinner homemaker. Embracing breadwinner homemaker roles as the self-evident God-ordained roles for women and men, fundamentalists and evangelicals decreased tension with society that decreased tension in society, as did mainline Protestants, who also embraced Brethren homemaker rules. While the Brethren homemaker gender ideal remains the most iconic standard of American and Christian gender ideals, it began to fray as early as the mid-1960s, with higher levels of education for women, compressed childbearing and rearing, and an expanding service economy, middle-class white women re-entered the labor force in striking numbers. As real wages for men began to fall, Working wives became critical for families trying to maintain a middle-class lifestyle. Responding to these changes, social and economic conditions and a push toward equality for women dominating discourses of the larger culture, mainline or church-like denominations adjusted their practices, decreased tension with the culture, and adopted more egalitarian gender theologies. The sect like conservative Protestants blamed working women for rising divorce rates, out-of-wedlock births, declining marriage rates, and the destruction of the American family. By the end of the 1970s, the word feminism had become conservative Christianity's true effort. <laughs> Fundamentalist and evangelical Christians rejected equality and feminism outright, making the case that gender hierarchy and difference were not only the clear message of the Bible, but unavoidably reflected in the physiological and psychological differences between women and men. Unable to dismiss the spread of feminism in the culture and the church-like denominations, conservatives worked to discredit it. One tactic was to claim that egalitarianism undermined the authority of the Bible by treating texts related to gender as culturally relative truths when they were clearly timeless truths. 
Moreover, according to conservative Christians, when egalitarians treated texts on gender as culturally relative, they were distorting God's ordained hierarchy, erasing the cultural differences between women and men in both function and authority. The result of this, of course, would be utter social chaos. In the mid-1990s, conservative Christian rhetoric and practice shifted. With most of their constituents dual earning families, conservative Christians decreased tension by redefining the breadwinner homemaker idea as a headship submission theology. Preserving gender hierarchy, the headship submission theology allowed dual earner families to maintain their idea of gender essentialism. Yet even with this, by the end of the 20th century, social scientists and historians specializing in the study of gender and religion found that conservative Christian hierarchy had yielded to pragmatism. Most conservative Christians affirmed two ideals. They affirmed the ideal of husband's headship and the ideal of partnership in marriage. Conservative Christians use hierarchy as a baseline understanding of gender relations, but with headship and submission, they softened it with complementarianism, which argues that women and men are created equal in essence, but different in role. Part three, gender and Marska. The softening of strict gender ideals and practice produced a competing sectarian theology, neo-muscular Christianity. <laughs> this is the entire reason to have a PowerPoint for this <laughs> Neo-muscular Christianity adopts masculine styles and develops programs that teach men to be manly, casting Jesus as a religious rainbow and portraying the Christian life as a heroic quest of spiritual manhood. Books like John Eldridge's Wild Heart state that men are hardwired by God to be wild and dangerous creatures, that all men need to live three essential desires, the desire to fight a battle, to live an adventurous life, and to rescue a beauty. Men are told to reappropriate traits like action, leadership, courage, and economic prowess as exclusively male by biological and divine design. The rise and fall of Mars Hill Church emphasizes the social nature of sect-like movements and the importance of gender challenges <coughs> as boundary markers. Former local pastor Mark Driscoll received international attention for his rhetoric of Christian masculinity. Driscoll's strident masculine focus helped Seattle's Mars Hill Church become one of the fastest growing congregations in the country. Driscoll's theology reverted to a strict gender essentialist ideology. In an online forum from December 2000, Driscoll outlines his perspective on gender. Posting as William Wallace II, a nod to Mel Gibson's character in the movie Braveheart, Driscoll writes, We live in a pussified nation. We could get every real man as opposed to pussified James Dobson, knockoff, crying, crimes keeping homoerotic, worship-loving mama's boy, sensitive, masculine, bitter, exact male, replicate even jellyfish, and have a conference in a phone booth. It all began with that, the first of the pussified nation who kept his mouth shut and watched everything fall headlong down the slippery slide of hell feminism when he shut his mouth and listened to his wife, who thought Satan was a good theologian, when he should have led her and exercised her delegated authority as king of the planet. And so the culture and families and churches sprint to hell because the men aren't doing their job, the feminists continue their rant that it's all our fault, and we should just let them be pastors and heads of homes and run the show. And the more we do, the more hell looks like a good place because at least a man is in charge. <laughs> <laughs> Driscoll's gender theology created significantly more tension to the culture than the soft patriarchy of symbolic tension. Driscoll preaches strict gender essentialism and complementarianism as the the last annual report they had shows, if you can see in the slide up in the um, right-hand corner, complementarianism at Mars Hill was defined as God made men and women equally important, but gave them distinct roles in the church and home. 
Like other neo-muscular Christian proponents, Driscoll blurs the line between sex and gender, proclaiming that gender is fixed, unchanging across time and place. In his words, chicks should be chicks, dudes should be dudes. That's the way it is, because gender roles are not subject to change and preference. Driscoll's theology is hierarchical, with the man as the head and the woman as his helper, as he describes. The Bible lays out authority and respect for authority and submission to authority. God the Father and then who? Jesus Christ. And then who? The husband or the man. And then what? The woman or the wife. That's the order of authority. A lot of you women will say, I don't need to submit to any authority. Well, you're not any better than Jesus. And if it was good for him, it's good for you. While Driscoll draws clear lines between women and men, his focus is on men. Here's what he says. Marcel's about men. We see Marcel's a man factory. Boys come in, men go out, period. The cornerstone of Driscoll's masculine theology upholds Jesus as the ideal man. Describing him in the Vintage Jesus Sermon series, Driscoll says, Now this guy right here, I can't take him, right? He's got a robe dipped in blood. Any guy who has blood as an accessory is tough, right? And it ain't his blood, that's another point. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name room. King of kings, lord of lords. Tattooed down the leg of Jesus, right? This is tattooed up, white horse riding, blazing eyes, all seeing sword come to slaughter the nations, robe dipped in blood, Jesus. Love that guy. <laughs> Just so tells his audience that men need to be masculine, like this robe dipped in blood, Jesus. Driscoll uses the Apostle Paul to show how men can learn Christianity from Jesus. So Jesus comes down out of heaven and basically beats Paul up, which I love that. I love that about Jesus. Paul's out making trouble, Jesus comes down from heaven and smacks Paul around. Kind of like an ultimate friend. I love that about Jesus, because you never know when he might show up and just knock you around a little bit. Jesus comes down from heaven, knocks Paul on the ground, and blinds him for three days. Yeah, if Jesus came down and like punched you in the mouth and then made you blind for three days and said, you're going to be a Christian now, and you're going to be a missionary, after three days you'd be like, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Now that I'm blind, and I would like not to be blind, so that's what Jesus does. <laughs> Once Driscoll establishes Jesus' ultimate masculinity, he casts a hyper-masculine lens over the interpretations of other biblical characters. You got around Paul when he was a young guy. You got around John the Baptist or Elijah. I mean, these dudes seem pretty rough to me. You know, they don't look like church guys walking around in a sweater vest singing love songs to Jesus. I mean, guys like David are well known for their ability to slaughter other men. I kind of think these guys were dudes. Heterosexual, one of bite, punch in the nose, dudes. Another important component of neo-muscular Christianity is a man's ability to be the sole economic provider for his family. Like Jesus the carpenter, who was the normal walking guy with a lunchbox and a tool belt, being the breadwinner is an essential trait for Christian men. Driscoll explains. Paul says if a man does not provide for the needs of his family, he's denied the faith. He's worse than an unbeliever. Driscoll takes the breadwinner homemaker ideal a step further, telling men who don't fully provide for their families that they are neither real men nor real Christians. For pastors like Driscoll, Neo-muscular Christianity creates strict boundaries between the congregation and the culture at large, helping the church to thrive, because sect movements thrive on tension, distinction, conflict, and threat. While Driscoll successfully created high tension between his congregation and the larger culture, he did more than that. He created a religious group with all of the hallmarks of strictness. Marcel was extensive, it was exclusive, and it was expensive. Recall that strict religious bodies proclaim an exclusive, comprehensive, and eternal doctrine, demanding adherence to a distinctive faith, morality, and lifestyle. Sect-like groups distinguish two classes of people, true believers and the heathen, or heretics. Marcel created clear boundaries around who was a true believer, cementing the collective identity of the Marcel family. There's a lot of people who say they're a Christian, and they're not. Well, we're not all Christians. Some of us are lying or deceived. Just like when you look at Jesus and his 12 disciples, there was Judas on the team who looked like he was on the team, but was ripping off Jesus and didn't love him. There's always a few Judases in the bunch. In this church, there are people who love God and are living new lives. There are people who aren't living new lives, which indicates that they don't love God. 
Mars Hill created a very expensive group. Mars Hill not only put boundaries between the congregation and outsiders, but they also generated boundaries within the congregation. Driscoll Phillips describes this threat from within. So the question is, if Mars Hill is constantly under attack from within by people that are deceived and claim to be Christians, how in the world does a church like Mars Hill defend, protect itself from this kind of deception coming in, leading to the destruction of the church, getting completely off track, and thus becoming yet another church that had a great start and a tragic end? Mars Hill members understood that the biggest threat to the congregation came from within. They even had a phrase for this, wolves in sheep's clothing, as this letter um, from Mars Hill Ballard illustrates. One woman articulated for me in an interview how she interpreted this dynamic <coughs> at Mars Hill Church. The core mission of Mars Hill Church is to give you direct ways to get to Jesus, and it may cost you friends, loved ones, family members, and lovers, because loving Jesus is the core mission. But that breeds a distrust between the people in the pews, and that distrust has to occur for someone to be on board with Mars Hill Church. When Mark Driscoll talks, there's a divide between those who are Christian and those who aren't. <clears throat> you are never sure who's next to you in the pew, if it's a believer or not. So you better watch out, because there's a responsibility that comes with being a Christian. There's never a settling in. You're always on Costs were high for those who did not or could not conform to group doctrine. The ever-present threat of being defined by the community as a wolf kept members adhering to the complementarian gender theology. A strict gender theology, however, is not always a successful strategy for groups. Shifts in the economy and other social conditions impact the ability of members to maintain the theology. For nearly 20 years, Marcel sustained an optimal level of strictness, resulting in explosive congregational growth. But things were changing for Marcel and their strict complementarian theology. In the wake of the economic recession, Marcel Church exceeded the acceptable limit for strictness. As Marcel fell apart over the summer of 2014, many stories emerged linking the church's strict gender theology to the dissolution of members who found they could no longer practice the complementary doctrine. These former members described their initial acceptance of the gender theology at Mars Hill. <coughs> Mark set a high bar for men, a mix of hardline complementarianism. I and many others in Mars Hill mirror much of what Mark taught. We'd get together and watch UFC fights. We'd take our brothers to task when we saw them not looking like the cultural version of men Mark pressed us to look like. At Mars Hill, I felt like women were occasionally brushed aside in favor of men. I even felt that Mark gave permission to objectify women as long as the woman was their wife. But I never felt like it was misogynistic. That team seemed too strong, too extreme. Complementary relationships was a belief I had not previously held. Men and women are different. We do different things and have different qualities. Since my husband and I had chosen for this season of our lives traditional roles, where he works and his family with our children, complementary roles seem to affirm the choices we have made of our family. Economic shifts in the culture, however, altered the costs of complementarianism. Even for those who had followed the prescribed complementary path, circumstances changed and costs became high. Over time, we were influenced by the pressure we heard from the pulpit on how we need to have children because they are a blessing, and it is not biblical to use birth control. The more we went to church, the more we thought about having children, and so we changed our plans and got pregnant. But during the recession, when Sarah's husband lost his job, she was told by congregational leaders that her husband wasn't doing enough and wasn't fit to be a father or husband since he had no job, as if all his other godly qualities are worthless because of the economy. Unfortunately, I agreed with the church and started to resent my husband for not having a job. I did this because I believed Mars Hill knew God's plan for our marriage. Like Sarah, others from Mars Hill watched their spouses struggle with the complementary doctrine, making them question its ideals. I want to share how harmful Mark's preaching was to my husband, because I love him so dearly, but that is his story to share. What I can say is that my husband is the most humble man I know, 
I am still sad about what he went through for years as a result of being told almost every Sunday how he's not man enough, how he needs to live up to unrealistic expectations, and how to live by the gospel of hard work and shame instead of the gospel of grace and love. Misogyny. There, I said it. I stood idly by and willingly participated in a culture of misogyny. There could probably be books and sociological studies on the details of this, but I prefer to just admit one of the biggest things that I did wrong. During this time, I made some huge mistakes. I pressured my brilliant and hardworking wife to give up her dream of law school and have a baby and be a stay-at-home mom as soon as possible. As they began to see the gender doctrine differently, some worse for women and men expressed concerns about the impact of the strict complementarian theology and their complicity to the system. People were afraid to question the severe complementarian theology Pastor Mark encouraged. But what was more difficult to see were the ways in which the chauvinistic culture was negatively impacting the marriages of people I knew and loved. I knew women who were afraid to deny sex to their husbands, women who were afraid to pursue passions outside the home, and women who were afraid to speak about the neglect they experienced from husbands who were absorbed in ministry. These women thought that any unhappiness they felt was because they weren't praying hard enough, didn't know how to submit to their husbands well enough, didn't have hearts that were right enough. Whereas women were concerned about how other women were impacted by gender theology, men were more likely to express how they had participated in the shaming of other men. Over the past few months, I've sought forgiveness from several men I sat across from and shamed. I yelled at them and intimidated them for failing to stand up for, as men and not having their shit together. The hardest thing for me as I process my time at Marcel Church has been my response to Mark shaming men, shaming me from the pulpit. For others, the consequences of following the strict complementarian theology were severe. I took what I was being fed and foolishly believed it because it was disguised so well with scripture. I believe what was preached numerous times over the years about how women should look, so much to the extent that I thought I was being a good wife by starving myself so that I'd be pleasing for my husband to look at, almost to the point of my death. Marcel's gender theology did not change, but economic conditions did. Marcel's strategy to set themselves apart from the culture and from other religious groups made it impossible for them to accommodate to changing social conditions. Their strict complementarian theology simply became too expensive. For many members, their inability to meet Marcel's gender standards resulted in a loss of their faith. Marcel is left me about formally joining any large church as a member or even attending one ever again. I'm cynical about pastoral celebrity, pastoral machismo, men's groups, Christianity. I don't want any part of it. I no longer consider myself a Christian. American Christians have regularly shifted their gender theologies in response to cultural changes. Sex church theory explains how and why Christian gender theologies develop in certain groups at certain points in time. Groups change their theologies in order to maintain a particular level of attention to the society. The current secular cultural ideal of gender is egalitarianism. Therefore, sect-like groups adopt headship submission gender theologies to be in greater tension with the culture, while church-like groups adopt egalitarian theologies to be in lower tension with the culture. For sectarian groups like Marcel Church, Increasing tension by adopting strict essentialist or complementarian theologies may initially produce high levels of commitment. In the midst of changing social conditions, for example, a significant economic recession, strict gender theologies may impose demands that simply become too costly for members. American Christians often have trouble seeing the impact of social and cultural forces on our religious institutions and belief structures. Unfortunately, that leaves us vulnerable to adapting to a status quo that shapes and may even subvert Christian ideals. 
The Apostle Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Sect church theory states that religious groups shift their gender theologies as a reaction or accommodation to the culture. That makes the world or the culture the reference point for Christian theologies. What if shifting our gender theology by reacting to or accommodating to the world, the culture, is making us lose sight of what the passage asks us to do? Be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we may discern the will of God. One of the gifts the liberal arts is gives us is a framework for the renewing of our minds. As one of the disciplines within the liberal arts, sociology gives us tools to critically assess the gender theologies we take for granted. And critically thinking about the social forces that may constrain our faith and hurt our ability to live in and bring about the kingdom of God, sociology helps us to become aware of how or if we are being transformed by the gospel message. My hope is that this review of Christian gender theologies across time and within one contemporary case will help us more critically engage our religious culture to make sure that we are able to discern the will of God, what is good and acceptable. Unique practices. 
So you and I can disagree about the theology, and it's not a problem because we come together each week in these sacraments that hold us together as a community, which is why you see, you do see smaller groups within, <coughs> for example, do that, but they never ever walk away from Catholicism. Whereas Protestants just. <laughs> I wonder how you would classify the church in the Book of Acts as, as a portrait in the Book of Acts in terms of these tensions, these strictness. How would you classify the church as it's presented in the Book of Acts uh, in your catalogs? I put it very much uh, with the revolutionary era revivalists. Whenever there is revival, you see that any kind of social status just disappears. It's more important to win souls to Christ. And so, um, rich and poor, letter and ignorant men and women are all interested in furthering the gospel of Christ. So those types of things don't, um, they don't make a difference. And so with revivalism, you just see this kind of egalitarianism. There's a great book by one of my mentors, Rodney Stark, called The Rise of Christianity. And he actually deals with the early church. The first 300 years of the church, um, not only was very egalitarian in terms of gender, um, race, social class, those types of things, um, but some people call it communist. <laughs> because they should. It was about, you know, I described, it's not a family of biological ties, but it's a family of grace by salvation. And so in the Acts Church, that's the same type of response that you see. And questions from students. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I was wondering if you could list some, sorry, I was wondering if you could uh, talk about some modern uh, groups that you would define as sects today, but do share more egalitarian gender norms. It, are those, do those exist? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so here's why. Um, if, you know, in your handout, I, had, I didn't do this in my, in my talk, but in your handout, I, I made the note somewhere under the long decade that we actually shift terms. By the time we get to the end of the 1970s, beginning of the 1980s, we don't talk really about sect church. We talk about fundamentalists, evangelicals, mainline, and then a little bit later we start to talk about liberals. So the reason we call conservatives and, or, um, fundamentalists and evangelicals conservative is partly because of their gender ideology. So anymore in American Protestantism, the sect like side of the continuum is really defined by gender. So Margaret asked earlier, how do sex become more church-like? Um, sex church process is a two-way street, and this is my dissertation. It's only about 254 pages if you're interested in it. <laughs> um, in that the high water mark for a sectarian group is usually the day that it is founded, because successive generations are just not as interested. And so either they die with the first generation, or they do have to accommodate to the culture in order to survive. So the process had always been seen as a one-way street. But it doesn't have to be, because theoretically, you have a dynamic process. So what we saw in the late 1970s and in the midst of the 1980s or the 1990s were denominations who were so afraid of becoming church-like that they took a stance, and here's where it's interesting, and here's how it relates to gender is that in order to become more sect-like, the three denominations that did this, and it's the first time in American history it happened, it was the Southern Baptist Convention, CRC, the Christian Reformed Church, I have to do it by um, abbreviations, and the LCMS, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. These three groups, in order to try and become more sect-like and to stop the church-like process, which was their fear, was to put restrictions on women. I read the Southern Baptist Convention statement, it's actually quite long, and they actually had to put three other codicils in their statement about women because they were stripping rights from women that they had always enjoyed. Um, so we've never seen sectarian groups because today, sectarian groups become more sectarian because of their gender ideologies, and that's just how it works. Any questions? Oh. Um, I have to ask about the Anabaptists because they uh, broke off from the main culture by creating their own subculture, counterculture. But have they experienced something similar to that? I mean, oh, yes. the church has split, but like within their own subculture, there has to be some tension. Yeah, a lot like. Oh, 
much. Um, Hillary asked me about the Anabaptist, <coughs> and of course I'm now going to use my midnight colleague's joke. Do you mean Anabaptist or John the? <laughs> I know it happens out there somewhere. <laughs> Just like Catholicism, Islam, Judaism, all of the monotheistic religions have experienced the same, the same process. So the Anabaptist traditions have as well. In, in my class, we talked about the fact that you can't actually have a pure sect or a pure church, right? Um, they're ideal types because a pure sect would so reject the culture that, frankly, they could not survive. So we look at the Amish, who have learned how to use a capitalist system to their advantage in small ways, because they have to be able to survive. So the Anabaptists have also, you have conservative Mennonites, for example, where the women all wear head coverings. Um, but you also have the general Mennonites, who are considered quite liberal socially and politically and in terms of egalitarianism. Um, sometimes people will refer to the, the more um, liberal Mennonites as universalists because they seem to think that God loves everyone. What is God thinking? <laughs> so it's the exact same process. In any one of these, you will see the same splits. Oh, thanks so much, Jennifer. Would you be able to say something about those three groups that you mentioned and what's going on within their educational institutions? Is there a tension, conformity, some of each? Um, within their <coughs> denominational institutions, there's really no tension because they have purged people who disagree. The CRC, the Christian Reform Church, has done a much better job, so there is tension within their denominational meetings because there are people who are still pushing for more egalitarian ideals. The Southern Baptist Convention is a great case study, and if you're interested in this, uh, Nancy Ehrman, who is a good friend of mine, sociologist at Boston U, she was actually present during the convention where they broke and the fundamentalists took control. And what they did over the course of the next 15 years was purge every denominational seminary and every denominational body of women in leadership. So they don't have a lot of tension because when people express a different desire, at least for the Southern Baptists, pretty much they are, they're not excommunicated, but Jimmy Carter, right? you know, Jimmy Carter a few years ago had to say, I had to walk away from my Baptist heritage because it was just too restrictive. That's not exactly how I said that was the idea. So you see, you see the same, the LCMS, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, they did the same thing. They just strapped women. And anybody, this is the slippery slope, right? This is actually why they created those new policies, is because people within the denominations, the Southern Baptist, for example, their flagship seminary is just a, a few miles from where I am from. And um, they have faculty members who believed in the ordination of women. And so when the folks in Texas heard that, they got really upset to say, see, we're going down that slippery slope. We're no longer distinctive. And that's actually the impetus for them purging all of their denominations of women. In fact, they got rid of all of their social work problems or their social work programs within their seminaries because more women were more likely to take those programs. So they just got rid of them. So there's no dissension there because you just leave. I have one or two more questions. Right here. Um, are those seminaries or those denominations able to survive just because there's enough white men to fill their schools? Like, as, <laughs> really though, like as diversity increases in the United States, aren't isn't that aren't they going to hit a breaking point as well? Um, I like the the spirit in which you asked that question. But let me say a couple things. They have suffered, no question. Um, although. Maybe 10 years ago, after about 15 years of significant decline and they were going to have to close another seminary, the Southern Baptist Convention created a new master's degree program, um, How to Be a Good Wife. <laughs> because a lot of men were coming to seminary with wives and they didn't have um, anything to do, so they created a master's program. But I need to make a clarification. It's not just men who embrace these ideologies. Women embrace these ideologies as well. It's, it gives a clear clear definition to many traditional teachings, and so it gives you a clear road in life. In a, in, in, in a post 
postmodern world, many people really long for clarity. Um, and when you have a clear doctrine, this is the same with Mars Hill, there was, it was clear. You knew what to do. And you know what? It worked. It worked for a lot of people for a long time. Until it didn't. And then there were significant repercussions. One more question. Mm -hmm. Dr. Green. Uh, Jennifer, I know you, you, you focus in your research on the United States, but do you have any thoughts on these ideas if they're transferred to places where there's outright hostility and repression um, and not allowed, uh, the Christians not allowed to practice their faith in any form? Does it stand up to situations like that too? It doesn't. Um, the United States is the most vital religious market in the world. We have the highest rates of religious participation. And I know you've heard a lot about the growing nuns. The N-O-N-E-S's, <laughs> not the other one. Um, and while the nuns are the people who have, who have no religious affiliation, and now up to about 20% of Americans, what's interesting is that's not actually a, a, a marker of a decline in American religion. Uh, since the 1980s, roughly 62% of American Americans have been actively participating in religion. So when you go to another culture, what you see is when Christianity is suppressed, you do not have these dividing lines because anybody who has any kind of belief, they have to figure out what the chaff is really quickly because they have got to hold together. So you don't see this. You only see sects and denominations and churches in a pluralistic religious marketplace because as soon as you and I disagree, with the disestablishment of religion in the U.S. Constitution, I can start my own church. And this is why persuasion is so important. Because in a, in a nation where they have a state-run religion, you are coerced. Because as soon as you are born, you are a member of that church. Your taxes automatically go there. And you don't have to go to church or do anything in particular because you're already covered. So in Sweden, which is our classic example, 100% of the people born in Sweden automatically belong to the Swedish Union Church but less than 2% actively participate in anything remotely related to the Swedish Lutheran Church because they don't have to. So when you go to other cultures where you don't have this type of disestablishment, this freedom of religion, you don't see these kinds of schisms because people of one faith, if they're Christian, they have to stick together. Thank you. I'd like to uh, invite Provost Van Duzer to come up or to award your meritorious scholarship. And then I have some party words. Easily, 
could be an expensive gift. Uh, <laughs> through the SPU Advancement Portal, just uh, uh, go onto the website and uh, Google Give, and um, choose the other in the drop-down box, and simply note Reader Lecture, and the gift would be much appreciated. There's goodies outside, and you are dismissed. Thank <laughs> you.